Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for the video cast. Today we are looking at the Inca Empire. And if you will take a look at the dates at the top of the slide here, uh, rather like the Aztec Empire, it's relatively short. It likely would have lasted significantly longer had it not been for the arrival of the Spanish. The other thing, though, is the fall of the Inca Empire uh, is later than the fall of the Aztec Empire. Um, and there's a geographical reason for that. We'll get into that later. As we're going through today, though, think about, obviously, how this relates to uh, the post-classical empires in Afro-Eurasia, but also compare and contrast to the Aztec empires. But before we begin, I want to point out the Inca Empire is by far the largest empire in the pre-Columbia Americas. Um, while it's, you know, it's easy to look at this and think that's not such a huge territory, the Andes are ridiculously long. And so the, the territory that that occupies is much, much larger than the Aztecs. Uh, and, and as we'll see, it's not only just because they have tributary states as part of their empire, but they're actually uh, conquering and colonize it. Okay, so to begin, the uh, rise of the Incas begin with a people called the Quechua. Um, rather like the Mexica are the people that start the Aztec Empire, the Quechua are the people that start the Inca Empire. And they are organized around certain clans called Ailu. Again, another significant uh, similarity to the Aztec Empire. Around 1350 uh, of the Common Era then, they established a city at Cusco, which is uh, going to become the capital of a great empire, beginning with this dude, uh, Pachacuti. Now, Pachacuti has the title Sapa Inca, the great leader, and the Spanish, uh, as we'll see, the, the leader is in charge of everything, and so when the Spanish are trying to get information from the local people, they keep using this word Inca. They're talking about their leader, but the Spanish think it means the whole empire, and so that's how we use the word today. Here's the point. Uh, we'll see in class the story of how he came to power is a pretty interesting one, but he reigns for a pretty long time, and he's the guy, though, that transforms Cusco from a city-state into a large empire. He's also the guy that built Machu Picchu, which we'll look at here in just a second. Uh, but the point is that the expansion, the imperial expansion that he starts will continue uh, well past his death and all the way up to the time of the arrival of the Spanish. And there's several reasons for why this happens, but those reasons are very different than what happens with the Aztec Empire. Here is an image of Machu Picchu, and you've probably seen this before. Uh, it is very high in the mountains and very isolated. The Spanish it did not like know about it for quite a long time. But the thing about Machu Picchu is it's not a city. It's a ceremonial center. It is a place where people throughout the Andes would come uh, to worship and, and celebrate certain rituals at certain times of the year. And as we've seen, this is kind of a common theme, not just in the Andean region, but throughout all of the Americas. Now, in terms of their culture, a polytheistic mythology, uh, not unlike many that we've seen before, the two most important gods, though, for the Inca were Viracocha, who was the creator god, and Inti, the god of the sun. And strangely enough, over time, those two gods start to sort of merge into one, particularly as we'll see in the, in the um, presence of the Inca, the Sapa Inca, uh, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. The mythology, though, is very heavily influenced by animism, the idea of nature spirit. So many of the mountains and rivers uh, that are like sites of um, ceremonial centers originated as places that were believed to have certain spiritual powers. Machu Picchu is uh, clearly one of those. It was a, a mountain that was said to have this very sacred uh, spirit itself. Another key component, though, in their culture is ancestor veneration. The, the veneration of your ancestors and this belief that 
even as they are dead, they still continue to influence what is happening in this life. And this is reflected in the practice of mummification among the uh, people of the Andes in general. Um, the, the, the preservation of the body is seen as having a spiritual power that continues to influence what is happening long after the person who occupied the body is dead. This is something we'll come back to in just a moment because another interesting feature about the uh, Inca is the way they pl practice split inheritance. Now, you may recall right about the same time in Japan, in the uh, feudal system that's developing there, they have split inheritance too, but there are two very different versions of this. In the Japanese system, when a daimyo dies, his uh, land and, and, and privileges are split equally among his sons. But the way the Inca did it, when a in, uh, Sapa Inca dies, his uh, inheritance is split between him and his son, his chosen successor. So the split comes between the, the dead father and the living son. And here's how this works. The, the territory that is conquered by the Sapa Inca, after he dies, all of the wealth from that territory has to go towards a shrine, which includes the mummified body of the dead uh, Sapa Inca. And so what that requires is his son, his successor then, he has to go out and conquer more territory so that the wealth from that territory can sustain him after he dies. So think about it, like the, the, the mummy of the dead ancestor is supposed to have a temple built for it. There's supposed to be rituals performed for it and you know, food and drink and all sorts of things have to continually be ritually supplied to the dead ancestor. And so what happens over generation, every generation has to go out and conquer more wealth because not only are they supporting the uh, dead ancestors, they have to build that wealth to support themselves after they die. It's a very unusual system that is quite unlike anything that we see uh, elsewhere in world history. In terms of their political uh, system, the, uh, particularly after Pachacuti, the idea that the Sapa Inca is the son of the sun, the sun god is the father for the uh, Sapa Inca, becomes very, very pre prevalent. And what this leads to is a rule by God. This is a word called theocracy. We've seen before, um, but we haven't really looked at it too closely. A theocracy is where the ruler is not just the political leader, but he's seen as God or a god or somehow affiliated with the gods. This is not unlike, if you remember, the idea of a caliphate where the military and political leader is also the leader of the faith. Um, he's seen as having some sort of direct tie, whether through blood or uh, election from the Ummah, back to the prophet Muhammad. Now, the bureaucracy of this large state is run by the nobles. The nobles come from those 10 original clans, the Ailu. And again, this is rather similar to what happened in the Aztec Empire. Uh, the way they divide up their empire into provinces, each province is ruled by a member of one of those 10 clans who serves in effect as a kind of governor. Now, one of the things that's uh, interesting about the way they ran their system, though, the conquered people uh, were incorporated into the empire in a particular way. The nobles of the conquered people would be sent back to Cusco, and they would learn how to speak Quechua, and they would learn about the, uh, the uh, gods of the Quechua and the systems of the Quechua, and then they become like the Quechua and then are installed among the ten original Ailu. However, the uh, the territory that they conquer is 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 occupied. It's colonized. Like there are actually people there, and one of the things about this is the commoners 
would be moved around from place to place. And it's a very interesting system for maintaining political power because you never like the people that are are conquered never maintain a tie to a particular place which lessens their ability or their or their motivation to try to have some sort of uprising to overthrow the power of the Sapa Inca if you are constantly being moved around people that are from a particular place and have a, a long history and a deep emotional tie to it get moved to some other place they don't have a tie there, and their tie becomes more and more closely aligned with the state. Again, a very interesting system to maintain political control. In terms of their society, it was definitely a military society, which almost always implies gender inequality. It was certainly a patriarchal society. However, they did practice gender parallelism, which you'll remember. There's like two separate uh, hierarchies, one for men and one for w women, and we've seen this throughout pre-Columbian societies. The elite women perform public rituals just as the elite men do. Common women are typically involved in agriculture and producing textiles, um, that is to say weaving cloth and making clothes. But the point is they've got public lives. They're, they're not just limited to the home, as is the case in many of the patriarchies associated with Afro-Eurasia. Another interesting thing, though, is that in their gender parallelism, um, it, the men worship the sun god and the creator god, but the women worship uh, goddesses. And in particular, their highest goddess is the goddess of fertility which, as you may recall from the Neolithic period, is also associated with agricultural production. They also recognized parallel descent, which we have seen before. Uh, that is the idea that women pass their rights and titles on to their daughters, just as men do the same for their sons. But there's an interesting issue here because there is absolutely no property. And again, property meaning land versus property that you own. You might own things like you know, jewelry or decorations or tools that could be passed on to your son or your daughter, depending on if you were a man or a woman. But as we will see, there is absolutely no such thing as owning property in the Inca Empire. So let's take a quick look at how that works. Well, first of all, the Inca Empire, as huge as it is, has a really, really significant domestic network. That is to say, the, the exchanges that are happening within the Inca Empire cover a great deal of territory, as we'll see more closely here in just a moment. They did not have any contact with other civilizations, though. They did not have a long-distance trade network with Mesoamerica, for example. Now, occasionally they would trade with uh, farmers, uh, I'm sorry, with fishers along the coast, or they might trade with foragers from the Amazon in small little ways, but they didn't have any significant foreign trade. But the thing that uh, I meant, I alluded to earlier, is the state controls both land and labor. The Inc, the Sapa Inca, who is the embodiment of the state, literally owns everything. Uh, but I should point out, though, of course, part of that is owned by the ancestors that conquered that territory as well. But the the thing about it is. The land may be owned and controlled by the Sapa Inca, but he gives land to everyone in the empire. Even the conquered people get land. It's just they are using the land. They're not actually own it. And in this regard, many people consider this a kind of uh, proto uh, socialist system where the state literally owns everything, but equally distributes it in their system that is supposed to set it up so that no one actually goes hungry. Everybody has some land that they can use. That also includes a unique form of tribute 
the mita, which is tribute paid in the form of labor. It's a system not unlike what you might recall is the corvée system where you pay taxes in the form of labor. In the mita system, though, uh, it usually involves conquered people having to work a certain uh, period, a couple of weeks, I think it was, uh, typically every single year, but they would be like going to build uh, bridges, roads, infrastructure for the empire in some other part, and then they would go back home for the remaining part of the year. And as I mentioned, all sorts of projects, some of them we'll look at more closely here in just a second. In terms of the agricultural base of their economy, though, the potato was the key. They did, in fact, have uh, maize, but it was far less significant for potatoes. Now, the interesting thing about it is before the Spanish uh, arrived, there were over 200 different types of potatoes. The thing about potatoes, though, is they originally were poisonous. They had to be, uh, you know, ma manipulated over a long period of time to make them edible. The other thing about potatoes, as we'll see, they they are um, they're not stored so easily, at least not as easily as grain. Um, wheat, in particular, you dry it out; it could last forever. Corn, you can dry, and it'll stay out for a long time. But they came up with an unusual way uh, we'll look at later on to remove the liquid from the potatoes so that they could store them for long periods of time. Now, in order to grow these potatoes, they live in a mountainous region. They live in the Andes. So they had to come up with some unique techniques for how to do this. Terrace farming is one of them, obviously. Uh, but then they also have this really cool system called Waro Waro. Uh, in terms of the terrace farming, if you look at this particular image, you could easily imagine that is some place in East Asia, uh, in China, for example, where they had to do terrace farming to grow rice. But obviously, that's going to be the same thing in a mountainous region there. But the Waru Waru system is a really fascinating thing. And I'm, I'm going to not go into too much detail now because we'll come back to this uh, tomorrow in class more. But the idea is this, the Waru Waru system creates a kind of microclimate. Climate. Uh, they're at very high altitude, and so these little canals that are filled with just a little bit of water, during the day it gets really hot, and uh, the water starts to evaporate, and then at night when it cools down dramatically, it's going to create a, uh, a little mist around all of the potato plants, and it's going to stay that way uh, over the course of the night. And it creates a kind of blanket that's a, that allows them to move. Again, we'll look at this more closely in class later on. Finally, in terms of their technology, um, there's a whole lot going on. I mentioned the bridges and roads. They are at super high altitude with very deep uh, rivers and streams that have to be crossed. So they create a road system that includes bridges. The whole network, the whole road system combined is over 25,000 miles long. It's a huge uh, internal domestic network. They also employed runners to carry messages across the uh, empire. And they would go uh, rather like the caravanserai, except they were carrying information instead of, um, instead of goods. And they were using the kipu system, which I'll come to here in just a second, to create a kind of, um, it's, a, it's like a postal system, except for the, it's not exactly writing, it's the information, but carried orally. The, uh, one of the very few domesticated animals in the Americas, the llamas, were obviously crucial here because they could carry the goods at these high altitudes across this road system that they built. The llamas, uh, other than their wool, didn't have a whole lot more to offer them, but in this particular case, that's a huge advantage to use them as, uh, as, as pack animals to carry their goods. They're also very well known for their textiles, their, their cloth, their pottery, metalworking, which is kind of interesting. But one of the things I find fascinating is their masonry. If you look at this uh, image to the right, this is from a wall that's built, 
And you can see how very precisely they cut stones to fit. And they did this without mortar. Mortar is that kind of glue that usually goes in between blocks to hold it together. They didn't use that because they fit their stones so, so precisely. What's really amazing about that is they did this with only stone and copper tools. They did not have bronze. They did not have iron. And if you know anything about copper, it's very, very soft. It bends quite easily. So the fact that they did this without the, the, the tools that the Afro-Eurasians had is really quite remarkable. Finally, then, this was mentioned earlier, there's this record-keeping system called the Kipu system that uh, is practiced all throughout the Andes and had been for thousands of years that we'll take another look at in just a moment. This is a map we're going to look at more closely in class of the Inca road system. Again, you can see this is a vast domestic network. Uh, one of the things about it, as I mentioned, they uh, frequently have to cross high altitude rivers that are very, very dangerous because of the fast flow of the rivers. But one of the coolest things about the uh, bridges is they would frequently anchor them to roots of trees that were living roots. So it would not rot as it got wet and cold as it would, of course, at high altitude. In the bottom right picture, you see what remains of those roads. They were, in fact, paved roads. They were not just paths all throughout the empire. And finally, the Kipu situation. Kipu was originally invented as a kind of record-keeping system just involving numbers. But by the time of the Aztec Empire, the knots started to become used as mnemonic devices. And I mentioned the me messenger on their roads before. What they would do is they would memorize a message and the knots would be different parts of that. And the knots would then encode the information. The problem with that from our perspective is we don't know what the original messages were. So it's not, it's not something that we could you know, decode and read for ourselves. But at the same time, it allows information to be stored in a way that is meaningful to them. I want to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I went a little longer on today's presentation, but I look forward to seeing you in class.